So hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand, and I welcome you to this series called RBI Twenty Four Seven. So as most of you would be knowing that in this series we discuss a set of five questions which are related to finance and economics current affairs. So if you are preparing for any competitive exam, then this video can be beneficial for you, right? So let's not waste any time and move straight away to the lecture. But before doing that, I would like to ask you guys to. subscribe to our channel so if you are a new viewer here and you are watching our video for the very first time then do not forget to hit the subscribe button and if you press this bell icon it can help you to get notified whenever a new video comes up after that you can also join our telegram group on this group you can post all your doubts and queries and we will try to get back to you as soon as possible right okay are you ready for question number 1 so here is the question number 1 and this question says what does it refer to okay so basically this question talks about something uh, and some statements related to that answer is given to you you can pause the video and you can read the statements carefully and then decide with your answer okay so moving ahead to the solution and the solution is option b option b means premium right so this question was asked by one of you in the comments So here we are talking about premium. So guys, if you remember in a recent session when we talked about share swap, in that video we learned an example, and in that example there was a term called premium, right? So premium is a very common term. We generally use it for something which is very good or very nice or basically giving you the worth of your money, right? So uh, if you buy some clothes from a way. a very uh, established brand that you say okay i bought i've done some premium shopping or i bought some premium clothes right so premium is something that is very uh, that that is going to give you the value of your money right so now try to put this in case of acquisition when one company so this is no different than shopping one company let's call it a limited is going to by another company called b limited right so if the the deal is very good for a limited and it holds great growth potential in future then a limited might be willing to pay some premium for this deal right so premium is the difference between estimated real value of the company and the actual price price paid to acquire it in and mergers and acquisitions transaction so um, try to okay we we can try to understand with the help of this example let's say two of your friends they are getting married at the same time right now these two friends they need to buy a dress for their wedding which is designed by their favorite designer let's say manish malhotra right so both of these girls they want a manish malhotra dress but that is but only one let's say one dress is available okay so the one who is willing to pay a higher price is going to buy that dress or is going to get that dress so let's say two girls a x and y so let's say x is willing to pay a higher price let's say the dress the, the dress is priced at 1 lakh but X is willing to pay one lakh twenty five thousand, whereas Y is stuck and Y is saying no. If the if the price is this, I'm not going to. Or if the dress is worth one lakh, then I'm not going to pay a penny greater than that, right? So obviously, who is going to get this dress? X, the person who is willing to pay the premium. So similar is the case or in companies. So if you need to buy something good, you will have to pay higher. That is why if acquiring b limited holds great potential for a then they are willing to pay some premium for it they are willing to pay something extra for it which is more than the real value of b limited right so they are paying that extra money for the growth potential so this difference is called premium so i hope now you are clear with it but it is not necessarily present in case of an acquisition okay we discussed one case where this company acquisition is <coughs> is i'm sorry is beneficial to the acquirer but what if 
this company is not a very good company and b limited is having some trouble it is in controversies for some sort of let's say corporate governance issue right so in that case it is risk for a limited to buy b limited and it is not going to pay a premium in that case it might get a discount right so whenever uh, whenever regulators they make sale of stressed assets or they make sale of companies who have defaulted or who are debt ridden in that case they provide some benefits some extra benefits to the buyer to attract them or they try to sweeten the deal by putting some of their money or by laying off some sort of debt so that it becomes attractive to the buyer <coughs> right so um, an acquisition can, might take place at a premium or discount or at the real value of the company so premium is not necessary to be present in case of acquisition i hope now you are clear with these two statements moving ahead okay some more information about premium increased cost of buying i think we have discussed much about it that it it, it obviously increases cost for the buyer or the acquire company no requirement that a company pay a premium for acquiring another company not necessary in fact depending on the situation it may even get a discount i just gave you an example typically an acquiring company will pay an acquisition premium to close a deal and board of competition so this is one major point here board of the competition so guys the example we just discussed of two girls so x was willing to pay a higher price for the dress to ward off the competition or to get rid of her competition that was y right so in in a similar sense companies are willing to uh, pay more to acquire a good asset so that uh, their rival might not uh, acquire it or have benefits of it so to getting rid, uh, for getting rid of composition acquisition might be uh, acquisition premium might be paid to if acquirer believes that synergy created from acquisition so the benefit uh, from this combination of industries will be greater than the cost of acquiring the target company so company is going to pay the premium when it believes that the benefit that it is going to get in future from this acquisition is greater than that premium that they are paying now right so if we talk about that x and y example so x is willing to pay 25000 more for the dress just because she thinks that she is going to get a satisfaction of higher than that or she is going to be uh, uh, her happiness is going to be more than that 25000 which is being paid extra right so the resultant uh, so the company is expecting that the result would be greater or result would be profitable for them and then this premium might not seem like a big deal size of premium depends upon various factors like the degree of competition in the industry if there is no competition there is no need to uh, give a high premium the presence of other bidders and the motivations of the buyers and sellers so there can be many factors affecting the amount of this premium right in financial accounts acquisition premium is recorded in the balance sheet as goodwill so we also discussed this in the session where we talked about that this premium is also beneficial for the acquirer company right obviously they are spending some money on it but it is beneficial for them because they can show this premium as goodwill in their accounts which is going to reduce their taxable profit right so they they are killing two birds with one stone the first of all they are getting rid of the competition they are buying the company and also they are getting some uh, reduction in their tax payments right just because they acquire one asset by the name of goodwill then obviously they are going to get some rebate for this for this uh, money which is being paid for the acquisition right so it acts as a loss uh, tax reducing factor moving ahead to the next question and the next question says which of the following is correct about transfer pricing so this i think this is an uh, this is a topic which has been uh which has been asked by you guys many a times transfer pricing so you have to select the correct statement regarding that moving ahead to the solution okay the solution is d the correct option for this question is d transfer prices that differ from market value one entity benefits while the other is hurt by that transfer right so uh, before talking about this statement let us understand what is the meaning of transfer 
pricing, right? So I think this picture might help you to understand better. There is one entity X, one entity Y. So basically, transfer price is the price offered on the sale and purchase of a good or service between two companies which are under one umbrella organization, right? So let's say there is one company by the name of X Limited. Under this, under this X Limited, there are two units called A Limited and B Limited. Now this A Limited, it is into producing wheels or tires for cycles and B assembles these cycles, right? So they are into a similar business. Obviously, B is going to need some raw material from A, right? So if A is selling some uh, goods to B, so they can, they, they obviously sell their wheels to other companies as well, who manufacture cycle. But if they are selling these products, their products to one of their own units, one of the units, which is under their own parent or umbrella organization, in that case, the price that will be charged within this deal Will, known, will be known as transfer price, right? So why is this so important? Transfer pricing is important because it sometimes provide uh, an opportunity to companies to uh, inflate their uh, inflate their cost prices or uh, sorry inflate their cost and reduce their taxable profit. Basically, it helps them in tax evasion. It helps them to reduce their taxable profit or it sometimes helps them to transfer their profits from a country where taxes are high to a country where taxes are low right so uh, in the earlier video also where we talked about uh, the uh, where we talked about shell companies we talked that how uh, we discussed that how one company creates another company just to take profit or just to inflate their cost Right? So now this question says <coughs> that the price which is being charged between these two companies transaction should be equal to market price. Let's say if A limited sells wheels to another entity, B limited, which also manufactures cycle, but this D limited is not related to their parent company X limited in any situation, but this is an independent concern. Right? So the price that A would charge selling to D should be the same price that it should offer to B. There should be no difference between them, right? Because if same price equivalent to the market price will not be charged, then only one of them is going to have the benefit. The other is going to, uh, the, the other is going to face some kind of loss, right? So you just imagine what if A limited charges a lesser, let's say it sells one tire for rupees 100 to D limited, but it is offering one tire at rupees 90 to B limited. Then obviously its revenues are getting down and it is profitable for B as it is getting the product at cheaper price, but not profitable for A. So profitable only for one. But if there is opposite, let's say it is selling it at 110 instead of if it is so A limited, charging 100 to outside organizations but 110 to B limited. In that case, B limited is suffering a loss because it is getting a higher price. If it buys from market, let's say from any other organization which is outside the purview of their own parent organization, in that case, they might find the product cheaper, right? So B facing a loss but A making a profit because it is getting a higher amount. Whereas if it sells to an outside concern, it gets only 100. Right? So if the price between them is not equal to the market value of that particular product or it is not equal to the price which is being charged from unrelated parties, then it is going to be advantageous only for one company and disadvantageous for the other one. Right? I hope now the concept is clear to you. So basically laws have been set in this way to tell these companies that you should carry out the transaction without thinking that you are related somehow, but think that you are unrelated and carry out the uh, carry out the transaction at an arm's distance. That means 
forget the closeness or relation between you but uh, do the transaction enter into a transaction as if you are unrelated at the same price whatever you are charging from the market right if the price is charged same then the balance is there right and uh, and the pro and it is not the situation where only one is getting the profit right so i hope now this is clear to you moving ahead to some more information about transfer pricing the price at which related parties transact with each other so related parties right it means so i gave you an example how uh, there are two concerns under one parent organization so transfer prices used when individual entities of a larger multi entity firm are treated and measured as separately run entities right so they are being treated as if they are separately run and they are forgetting that they share a relationship transfer price can also be known as a transfer cost and transfer prices that differ from market will be advantageous for one while lowering the profits of other entity so mnc's can manipulate transfer prices in order to shift profits to a lower tax region right and how can they do it we also discussed this in the case of shell shell companies let's say a company in a high tax country can sell, can sell their product to this company which is in a low domain low tax country let's say this entity sell something to this entity which is in a low tax country and then again buys back the same quantity let's say if it is selling something at 10000 and buys back at 20000 now they are getting the same goods but uh, their profits have transferred to y because y is getting a higher revenue a higher price and this entity is it is suffering a loss but there is one thing due to this loss due to this increased cost they are going to get rebate in a tax in their payable tax in a country where tax is high and they have increased profits in a country where taxes are low right so this can be used as a medium to tax, to evade tax that is why law says that carry out the transaction at an arms level distance to remedy this regulations enforce arms length transaction rule right that requires pricing to be based on similar transactions done between unrelated parties so i hope the concept of transfer pricing is clear to you moving ahead to third question for today okay here is the third question which says which one of the following is correct about bond duration and interest rates five statements given to you about a concept called bond duration right okay moving ahead to the solution guys you can pause the video give it a thorough read and then decide with your answer moving ahead to the solution here is the solution and the solution is option c so c means as a general rule for every 1% for every 1% increase or decrease in interest rate a bond's price will change approximately 1% in the opposite direction of every year of duration right so okay this might seem like a very complicated rule let us first try to understand what is the meaning of duration right guys we are not going on calculation here because if you go on how to calculate duration it becomes technical uh, involving a lot of calculations we need not do that we just understand the concept of duration so you guys have mentioned it multiple times that i should talk about bond duration now let's say you are buying a bond at rupees 100 giving you a 10% coupon rate coupon rate is the interest that you will be getting on this bond per year right you have bought a bond spend rupees 100 and you are getting a 10% return for let's say 5 years so the maturity of the bond is 5 years that means in year 1 you are going to get 10 rupees 10% of 100 in year 2 3 4 5 right so you are going to get 10% rupees 10 in each of the 5 year and when the duration and when the time period of this 5 year elapses you are going to get your rupees 100 back now coming to the duration in between see duration tells you that in how much time can you recover your money back see 
at the end you are going to get 100 rupees back and apart from that you are getting return in the form of this interest now what the money that you spent when you get the worth of that money back so that can be that can occur before the completion of the duration completion of maturity of the bond it can occur in let's say 3.5 years or 4 years or 4.5 years depending upon what return are you getting right so when you get the worth of your money back in that time we call it that we call that time duration so uh, okay try to uh, understand imagine let's say you have bought a car worth rupees 5 lakh right and your friend has bought the same car now here you are x and here is your friend y now being x you use your car a lot right now the manufacturer tells you that the car car the life of the car is about 10 years now since if you use it on an average basis if you do not overuse it or uh, on an average basis the duration is 10 years the life of the car is 10 years but x x uses the car too much right uh, so in that case the duration the, the the time in which x is going to get back the worth of his money is let's say seven years because he is using the car at a very fast rate whereas y who does not use the car much can carry on or can hold the car for even 12 years because he is not using much so basically x is getting the worth of his money in seven years whereas y is getting it in 12 years because he is not using the car much similar is the case with uh, duration so this is duration for this car right so when an investor gets the worth of his money that he has invested back that means he has recovered his money back in that time is called duration right and after that whatever he gets is the excess return okay now before discussing this rule let us discuss some more things about duration okay bond duration way of measuring how much bond prices are likely to change it I'll change if and when interest rates move let us leave it for a, a minute and get back to the second get to the second point which says it measures how long it takes in years for an investor to be repaid bonds price by the bonds total cash flows now these cash flows can be in the form of interest that you are getting on an annual basis or it can be the repayment that you get at the maturity of the bond right so that is duration now why are we talking about duration why is duration important because duration helps you to understand it is a way of measuring that bond prices how they would change to a, in relation to change in interest rates that means if interest rates change we know, so guys if you remember when we discussed operation twist uh, we discussed how bond prices they change with interest rates basically they are negatively related to the change in interest rates if the interest rate rise rises then the bond, the price of existing bond goes down and the opposite happens in case interest rate falls right so here uh, in that session we learned about the negative relationship but this point is telling you that how much is it going to change right so if interest rates increase by 1% what is the going what is the change that is going to be in the bonds price right so you can quantify it or you can estimate that okay if interest rates are changing what is going to be the price of my bond right duration measured in years generally the higher the duration of a bond the more its price will drop as interest rates so a bond which has a higher duration that means it uh, the investor who is putting his money into that bond is taking a longer time to recover his money back in that case the price of the bond is going to be more sensitive to the interest rates right so a bond with higher duration is a riskier uh, investment for the relatively riskier investment for the investor and obviously its price is going to change or react strongly to a bond which has a lower duration right so in 
while measuring duration it is beneficial to select a bond with lower duration because obviously then the investor is recovering their money back at a fast rate so understanding the duration is particularly important for those who are planning to sell their bonds prior to maturity see if you hold the bond till maturity then it doesn't affect you because you are going to get fixed flows uh, interest for the duration of bonds annually or semi annually whatever is the agreement and the repayment at the maturity but if you plan to sell it before maturity then you will have to uh, then you will have to estimate that what is going to be the price right factors that affect bonds duration time to maturity so the longer the maturity the higher is the duration of the bond right because the higher is the risk involved in a longer bond because many changes can happen in a long run period so a short term bond is less is uh, less riskier after that coupon rate so the higher the coupon rate the shorter is going to be the duration because you are getting more profit and you will be able to recover the worth of your money faster so the higher the coupon rate it is better for the investor so shorter is the duration the longer is the time the longer is the duration considering the risk involved in a long term bond so i hope now you are clear with the concept of duration and under this duration we talk about this point that tells you that with every 1% increase in interest rate increase or decrease what is the change the bond price is going to react 1% in opposite direction for every year of duration that means if interest rate rise by 1% that mean if interest rate rise by 1% then obviously the bond price is going to fall and it is going to fall 5% in the entire duration of the bond if it is a 5 year bond basically one year for every uh, 1% for every year of the dura of the uh, maturity of the bond whereas if interest rate fall in that case the bond price is going to increase and it is going to increase 1% for every year of the maturity of the bond let's say if the bond is 5 year that means the prices are going to rise 5% in a total of 5 years 1% every year right so this is this is like a thumb rule for calculating uh, the fall or increase in price with the movements in interest rates right i hope this is clear moving ahead to the next question here is the fourth question which says dash are large home appliances whereas dash are relatively light consumer durables moving ahead to the uh, solution which says that the correct option is a a means white goods are large home appliances like washing machine dishwasher right so why are they called white goods we are going to discuss it in a while whereas brown goods are relatively lighter basically uh white goods are those where it is difficult to move them and brown goods they are not very difficult to move like tv or a stereo right so you can see white goods so why are they called white goods because traditionally they were available only in one color that is white so lately they have they are available in many colors but a term that has stick right so it carries on so recently there was an article in life mint about white goods how their demand is moving in connection to the upcoming festive season right large home appliances such as stove refrigerator refrigerators freezers washing machine tumble dryers etc acs they are large which were traditionally available only in white although you can purchase it but okay moving ahead to the brown goods relatively lighter electronic appliances both of them are electronic appliances like radios computers tvs digital media players gaming console sometimes refers to these product as consumer electronics or light consumer electronic durable so i think a very simple question moving ahead so here is your last question for today which says following are few statements about different types of investments select the correct option in this regard so this question has recently been asked on one of the comments in the video the difference between etf and index funds we are going to discuss it now you can pause the video and select the correct option in this regard okay the correct option is option d which means all 
are incorrect. So all these statements, they are incorrect. First statement, DMAT account is necessary for in investing in, okay. Let us first try to understand the difference between them, then we can come back to the statements. So in this chart, you can easily see the difference. See ETF, <coughs> the main difference between ETF and index funds, they both try to trace the investments put into one index so that that can be sensex that can be nifty if you go internationally it can be s p 500 can be any index or nasdaq right but the main difference is that etfs they are liquid as compared to index fund because their trading goes on just like trading of a share happens whereas index fund is a kind of mutual funds where trading happens at the at the price which is calculated at the end of the day, right? You can see the difference. Okay. Meaning, meaning fund that tracks indexes of exchange of a, of a particular exchange and traded like stocks in other uh, traded like stocks on stock exchanges. So basically, you can relate them to stocks or you can relate them to shares like trading that happens in shares whereas index fund it is a kind of mutual fund right so an investment fund that tries to replicate the performance of a benchmark market index so <coughs> apart from being the liquidity difference one difference which is important here is the presence of tracking error now what is the meaning of tracking error? See, an ETF, what does an ETF do? Whatever money they have, they let's say ETF is trying to follow Sensex. So whatever companies comprise of this index, Sensex, the 30 companies, they try to divide their investment in those companies in the similar weightage in which they comprise of Sensex, right? Index fund tries to do a similar thing but there is something called tracking error in case of index funds because see as i told you trading happens in etf just like stock so they are more liquid but index funds they are not very liquid that is why they invest some of their money <coughs> into liquid investments and due to investment into that particular liquid investments they cannot replicate they, are, they cannot replicate the investments of the index properly or truly so basically there is some sort of difference between them which is called the tracking error so an index fund has the presence of tracking error you can see here asset allocation an index fund tries to replicate that of a popular index that it is trying to emulate and index funds are not having liquidity of their own hence they invest more in liquid securities index funds have tracking error which is not present in the case of ATF. right so what is it kind of index fund it is form of a mutual fund so it is more like shares whereas index fund is in more like it is a type of mutual funds so trading happens on an exchange in case of etf whereas index can be purchased in lump sum or can be uh, you can invest your money into an index funds using an sip right after that pricing throughout the day at the end of day since trading happens, ETF is priced using demand and supply of security in market. After that, index fund, its price depend upon the NAV or net asset value of the underlying assets. Orders, they are taken on a manual basis in case of ETF. Index funds, they can be automated because if you are investing through an SIP, that automatically gets deducted from your bank account. So you can automate, automate that. But if you, uh, whenever you want to trade, buy or sell, you have to give orders in case of an ETF. Flexibility, liquidity, high in ETF, low in index fund. Trading fees, obviously trading is happening, so index, ETF has uh, trading fees, whereas index fund does not have trading fees. Right, so, so guys, these were five questions for today. And this is it for today. I'll see you in the next session. I hope you find this session beneficial. Before ending this session, I would like to take one or two doubts. Just give me a second. Okay, this doubt was asked by Kabir. I hope now your doubts are cleared between ETF and index funds. Right? Premium was asked by Sindhu Barani. 
Okay. Rekha Rathor, she wanted to know that uh, how depreciation of a country's currency benefits the exporter. So, I think this has been a recurrent question. <coughs> so, Rekha, see, whenever a country's currency it de depreciates or it falls in value, the customers in other countries, they have to pay lesser amount to buy the goods of your country. Let's say Indian rupee depreciates. So, a customer based in USA, USA wants to buy Indian goods, has to spend lesser amount on it. So, that is, <coughs> sorry. So, that is why they increase the demand because obviously now Indian goods are cheaper to American customers. So, they increase the demand of Indian goods which obviously benefits the exporters. I hope this benefits you. So, guys, I'll see you in the next session. Till then, you take care of yourself. Keep your studies going on and thank you for being here.